Hello there. Um, we wanted to sit together as, uh, to continue part of the um, collaboration. You've heard of Gilbert and George, this is Phil and George. Um, well, first off, I, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, or make some observations about, about the nature of collaboration in the first place. Um, just some general points. Uh, one really good thing about it is the way that it unsettles the traditional frontiers of creativity and, um, you know, basically makes you have to um, cooperate uh, with somebody else. It's, uh, it challenges the very idea of authorship um, and, uh, and, and, and creative identity, the conventional one. So for that, it's, it's, it's been a very useful process. And if things go wrong, you can blame someone else. Like, exactly right. Yeah. Sort of, uh, it, it's helpful like that. And, and in a sense, that two-in-one process um, does uh, bring out what is also a sort of rather bipolar um, nature of, of making art anyway, I think, uh, when it's um, done even by an individual. The, the nature of creativity, it seems to be, you know, starts with a primary process where basically you're throwing ideas around um, you know, tossing up in a playful uh, kind of a virtual way what is possible and exploring that in, in the sort of, uh, uh, in that early, uh, almost unconscious sort of way. And then uh, along comes a secondary process where the critical fact factors come in and, um, and, you know, you're sort of censoring, you're, you're, you're disallowing what is uh, going to be seen, you know, by a third party. So, in a sense, this um, collaboration tends to bring out or exteriorize those elements that are part of the creative process anyway, I, I think. And so, you know, we play straight man and clown, or vice versa, um, Apollo and Dionysius, um, uh, you know, you name, or whatever couples you want. But, uh, Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think uh, making art together is sort of one of the highest forms of sociability. It just, it, it just feels like a good thing to be doing, making stuff uh, up. Uh, and, um, and it's also a very good way of escaping, um, you know, your own creative demons on your own. You know, like when you're working on your own, you basically have to figure out everything, everything by yourself. So it, it's kind of useful to have a bridge to somebody else. So it, it's... Um, it has uh, uh, maybe to tie in with the very first uh, speaker uh, with the idea of synergy, of, of bringing together sort of two unlikely elements um, and, and, and coming up with a surprising result. I, I always think of um, uh, domestic salt. If you just think about what salt is made of, on the one hand, sodium, which is a sort of a grey metal inflammable thing, and then chlorine, which is a poisonous green gas. I mean, how do those things come together to make salt? Um, and so speaking of salt, uh, we, our, our work downstairs is, is, is the negotiation table with the bread on it. And, um, and um, it, it also involved a collaboration beyond us because when we came here to Cyprus, we had to make the bread here and we were in touch with a village of Omodos where there was a, a, a baker and his wife and sister-in-law who helped us, uh, among some other people, to uh, produce quite a lot of loaves. And, uh, and, um, and in a sense, that extended the collaboration and, you know, with sort of lots of unlikely possibilities uh, emerging. Could we, could we make something that would last, uh, you know, something like bread last uh, long enough? Uh, maybe Phil can talk about that. Um, in a minute, but essentially, it's also part of uh, an acknowledgement of uh, of um, the sense that uh, art is, as well as being a commodity in the marketplace, which we know, uh, it is also very much um, part of a gift economy. And um, in a sense, I think that makes it makes it very uh, very interesting. Um, the people at Omodos donated their time and their and their fornos, the very big fornos. Uh, to make this work, so uh, we couldn't have done it without them. Tell me what is the name of the bread they made? Katen. Say it again. Katen. 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 What was wonderful was that uh, we actually were up in the mountains in this village making this bread. So 
when George and I started this collaboration, we would meet in Bondi down near the beach and sit down and have falafel on the beach, which is sand and salt. And we, <laughs> we had no idea uh, what we were going to make. There was no preconceived anything. That's why that thing downstairs looks so weird. We didn't know <laughs> where it was going or how it would end up. So, uh, and the process is still something that's evolving. When we were up in the village, uh, we got there and these guys said, look, there's this weird artist coming back. They're making this bread, but we can't eat this bread. It's hard. What the hell? What is this stuff? We make bread for people to eat, and these are artists. They're making this stuff. It's useless. And they were a bit upset about how are we going to deal with these people. So it was a wonderful day. It was a day of um, the photographers. These guys actually started making bread. The cameras went down. And at one point, we had seven or eight people making bread. It was a wonderful thing. Um, and near the end of the day, I brought all these tools from, from, from Australia to, to make all the very shapes of bread. And I gifted the, the bread, the, the bread making tools to these people. And we went off and had a coffee and came back and the women had gone nuts. They went, okay, we've got all these tools. And we now have permission to make bread with all these weird shapes. And they had feet and hands. And, and so they started making all this bread. Uh, and they were loosening up the bread that they made, which is called again, Arcadero. Arcadero. Arcadero, which is made with chickpeas. It's the famous chocolate. Sweet bread. So it's circular. We make circles, 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 25 years circles, circles. <laughs> and now we can make feet and we can make trucks <laughs> and we can make hands. And so it was a beautiful thing to actually see that. And so part of the installation downstairs was we have all these symbols we'll talk about in a minute. But, uh, we then included their work downstairs as well. It's part of the installation is what they made because it was just wonderful to see. They sort of went, oh, you want curly bits? And I went, well, check this out. I can make a cool up here in 30 seconds. <laughs> and they were just making this stuff that was fantastic. And I've been practicing at home making bread for, for a year. And uh, these guys were doing it so dangerously. It was remarkable. In terms of collaboration as well, one of the great things for me that's come out of this is the fact that I can now make better spunk corporate that I've got. <laughs> I can make really good data, so that was, that was a wonderful thing. So it's an evolving process. It, it, and the, um, uh, collaboration is, is that one word, I think, and it's just uh, listening and uh, hearing the other person and then responding and then making good stuff. So these guys, the other day, up in the mountains, looked at us, checked us out, and then after several hours, they had this permission that no one gave them to just make, and that was a wonderful thing. So part of what happened downstairs is, is, is from uh, the local community, which was a wonderful thing. Uh, and again, when we're sitting around coffee shops in, in Bondo talking about bread, George would say, well, look, check out the, we can talk about the, the demonstrations in Cairo. People were holding up bread, and in, in Arabic was saying freedom. So for example, if you look at the bread uh, on the table downstairs, the top row is all inscribed with various insignia. We actually have the Greek omidon bread laid out there, which is added. But we actually have to come up with a range of symbols. Um, for example, in Arabic, when you want to share food, one of the sayings is, I'm going to share salt, or I'm going to share bread and salt with you. When I share bread and salt with you, you are my brother, and we work together, and we, we manufacture, and we eat together. So we're at the table sharing sharing food. So one of the inscriptions is bread and salt. Um, one of the ones George showed me from the Arab Spring was people had holding up bread saying life. And in Arabic or in Egyptian dialect of Arabic, bread and life is the same text. So you have to have life and bread inscribed on the table, on the top of the table. So there's a, a, a description of a sow, a sow post in Egypt is um, somebody who won't even smile for hot bread. <laughs> a sour puss. Um, as well as um, in Egyptian movies, you can always tell the bad guy um, if, if bread drops, he doesn't pick it up and kiss it. And, um, and I think I remember from, from my yaya, um, as somebody who also used to have, do this, and I'm sure many of you have similar memories of uh, picking up the bread and, and seeing it as a sacramental thing, as a sacred thing. Um, and so that's certainly one component of, uh, of the choice of that material, which is sort of organic, it kind of restores, um, you know, the senses in a way, uh, which is a nice change from from the way in which uh, many of us have worked in the past. I mean, there's a sort of whole postmodern 
rather laminated feel to um, contemporary art. It's sort of a, you know, it doesn't really engage the senses in quite the same way. Um, but uh, in this case, there's something very ancient about the use of bread. You know, it goes back about 8,000 years, uh, invented in this part of the world. Um, there's something very childlike about uh, its sort of um, its quality. It restores, you know, by definition, uh, at least Latin definition, uh, uh, social bonds. Um, as you said, breaking bread is about sharing, and uh, uh, um, you know, the idea of companionship is is companis, companis meaning uh, meaning bread, so breaking bread together. And, and also, in, in, in times of, of, of war, in times of humanitarian crisis, uh, the thing people ask for most is, is bread, is flour and yeast. Um, it, it's one of those things that uh, people crave uh, in, in, in those, those times of, uh, of desperation. Going back to some of the symbology, uh, when you look at the top of the table, we actually have the double-headed eagle here, so you actually look at the orthodox uh, space. So when you talk about the fertile crescent, this whole area is it's built on bread. Uh, we were in Iran two weeks ago. The first thing that comes to your table is bread. You go to a, a, a Greek cafe on here, you get bread. It's, it's a universal uh, proposition. So it, it evolved somehow that uh, we, we started with bread. Our original, one of the things I was thinking of originally was to actually have a table and we would basically eat every day. And, and that's where you to me, but we feel like, damn, we're not going to cook for a month, so <laughs> we get a bit ugly, we get really fat. So uh, the, the idea of the bread slowly evolved, and particularly with the Arab Spring, where the essence of, of life is this notion of bread. So I'm getting back to this symbology. We have in the middle of the table, we have the, the double headed um, Byzantine eagle. It looks left, it looks right, it looks east, it looks west. Uh, so very much orthodoxy, and there's been a few people mentioned already today in various papers where this space, we actually look east and we look west at the same time. So it's very much uh, uh, an area and a space that we're, we're, I think is one of the most vital and one of the most energetic parts of the planet. And, and again, that idea of the on present. And moving down the table, um, we then have not done so well, but uh, you know, when you look closely at some of the bread, you'll see uh, for example, on one side of the table, the inscription on the bread is a predator drone. So in, inscribed into that notion is that you know we, we have the issues now of pre-Iraq and we actually have uh, a notions of, of, of the state being able to liquidate people without trial uh, on the table. And next to the predator drone, you actually have a little burning house. So you, yeah, it gives a reference to these, these collapses that are happening now and what's evolved out of Iraq and what's happening now with the new election, with the new president, they have this some sort of authority to liquidate people without trial globally. So the negotiation table is included with these things that, yes, we can share the bread, but maybe, you know, I'll, you can see that see the negotiation table has, has a wall. On one side of the wall, you have the, the, the Greek topoloi, the worry beads, on the other side you have the Islamic prayer beads. So there is, a, there is a, a divide this side of the table, there is the divide where the eagle looks left and right, east and west. And then we have the propositions on the table, what's going on now, what, what things are driving political debate of the day. So this is our idea of the negotiation table where um, uh, what do you bring to the table? Um, Quick few stories, I'll just do it quickly. Um, in terms of roadblock, um, the first time I was in Lebanon, I, uh, we got a Christian driver, we drove up and down the country. When we went south, the Christian driver became moderately upset and found things difficult when we went into the southern parts of the country, into particular sites. Um, so the first time through the roadblocks for the Christian driver, it wasn't bad, but then it got difficult for the Christian driver. Second time, I learnt about invisibility. So we, 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 got, uh, we went to Al Manar TV and got a, a Hezbollah driver who was indigenous to the local space down south. So the first trip was learning about the space. The second one was understanding invisibility and negotiating and moving through roadblocks. And so that second driver became invisible. We became invisible because we were part of the indigenous 
space. We had an old crappy car. He knew everybody on the roadblock. He could drive up to the roadblock and he asked the gunny, how you going, let's go through. It was a very easy proposition. Um, after the uh, Israeli invasion in 2006, we went down again to the southern Lebanon and it was a lot more different. Uh, we got a fantastic driver, Abul Ali. He was a wonderful man and typical Arabic wanting to be a gracious host uh, said, yes, I can take you down. The, the roadblocks were up. There were big roadblocks. No one was allowed down there. And uh, we stupidly went into the Minister for the Interior and said, look, we want to go south. They said, no. One of our friends was an art writer. said, look, I'm an art writer. I've got a, I've got a, a press pass. It's like, get out of here. So much for art writing and journalism. They didn't even consider him to be legitimate. Abu Ali wanted to be a good host. So Abu Ali said, look, let me I'll take it down there. So we went down to sort of down to Thai, and he said, my cousin, Lebanese, my cousin, I have a cousin in the southern Lebanon. His cousin turns out to be the uh, director, the general in charge of the whole of southern Lebanese army. So our passport through the roadblocks with it was a yellow sticky note. And on the yellow sticky note was his cousin's name and the mobile number. And we drove up to these now substantial roadblocks. The first ones were, the first time we went, the second one, we knew everyone was fine. They just had clash across. The third time we go through the roadblocks, everyone had started playing with roadside bombs. And the day, we, the day before we went down there, eight Spanish peacekeepers were blown up with roadside bombs. Um, so instead of having the clash across, we would drive around a corner and then you'd see a pile of rubbish and you'd see a guy standing there. Now the pile of rubbish was a tank and the tank was aimed at your car and we were on the side of the cliff, so if they didn't like it, you could blow it off the side of the, the road. So we actually went, managed to get through that roadblock and because of Abu Ali and that, uh, he would say to the guys on the road, you know, uh, where are your cars? No one's allowed through here. And he said, do you want me to ring this number? And they'd look at the number, they'd look at the name, they'd go, no, go through. Mm -hmm. And so we, I learned about negotiation. This was, this is, Again, coming back to the negotiation table, I learned uh, in, in that particular instance how do you how do you negotiate these roadblocks? It's a it's a particular art form. What I also learned when I came back was that it was a really dumb thing to do. Uh, we were going south to make photographs and photographs in particular areas, so we were very very keen. You get this sort of uh, as an artist, you become I think quite autistic. It's like well, people are getting blown up and there's rockets going over the border, but we need to photograph this area, so let's go down there. And take some photographs, which you did. And it turns out we were the only people in the area, except for the guys doing the roadside bombs and, and the, uh, the UN. So um, negotiation was great. I also understood about Arabic hospitality and it can take you like, oh yes, you want to go down there and get killed? By all means, let's go down, we'll go together, we'll all die together, but I'm a good host. So, um, it was, again, in terms of the, the conference, it was an interesting thing to, to negotiate these sort of ideas and notions of, of roadblocks. Um, one small other little one, actually, we came in here last week from Iran, uh, Lynn, my partner, is at a, an artist residency for two months in Mexico, the last two months. And the whole residency of the 11 or 12 hours, everyone is communicating by Facebook. No email, just Facebook. We land in Iran, new roadblock. The roadblock was, if you use Facebook, we will arrest you. So she landed in a roadblock in Iran. And so for one week or 10 days, we went into this roadblock where the space of the roadblock was electronic silence. That was quite interesting. The space in southern Lebanon we went into uh, was this space of extraordinary peace and quiet and calm, except for being able to see in the distance of about 50 metres the remains of a roadside bomb and perfect silence and this remarkable tension of nothing's happening but it could and that tension was remarkable so we managed to get through the roadblocks and it was a dumb idea. I distract so let's, mm. let's carry on. Um, well, just uh, maybe to return to the bread part and, and, and its sort of political nature, especially um, in the Middle East. Um, there, you'd often hear about bread riots and bread martyrs, people queuing up. Um, these people who 
lived on, you know, 50% of the population in Egypt lived living on, you know, two dollars uh, a week. Um, you know, suddenly having the, 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 the price of grain go up uh, colossally because of the subsidised wheat from, from America. Um, the Food for Peace program that had been around since uh, Sadat and then through Mubarak as well as Saddam Hussein. Uh, and, 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 and sort of people dying either of exhaustion or just simply fighting in the bread lines, uh, known as the bread martyrs, which in a way kicked off some of the, you know, together with, you know, um, in 2008, the sort of riots uh, in a textile uh, mill, uh, you know, resentment of, of police tortures and, and the fact that you couldn't simply put bread on the table for, your, for yourself and your children. Um, so I, I think you know there was there was a lot of, a lot going for for, for this uh, this thing. Um, the idea of the tablecloth, you know, if you want to talk about. Yeah, the, the idea of the tablecloth. Yeah, that's it. I mean, oh, okay. tablecloths. Tablecloths made of water. <coughs> I mean, tablecloths made of water. So the idea of water again, it's um, you know, coming from Australia. Our roadblocks in Australia is the um, Indian Ocean. We, we have a big moat. Ocean and that blocks all of our refugees trying to come to Australia. So the idea of water again, uh, it, it's actually like a roadblock. It sits, it sits as, as this barrier. And again, um, uh, up until recently, when we look at uh, Cyprus, it has this remarkable space of water around it. So we decided to sit the bread. The bread sort of operates like an island. And when you look at the tablecloth, the whole tablecloth is actually made of water. And in fact, it's a sunken map of Cyprus and you can actually, when you look onto the table, you actually can be able to see medieval inscriptions over the, uh, over the sea. It's a hallucinatory. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I think it ties in a little bit with Bernd's uh, yeah. talk about, about the Mari, Mari Liborum and, and, and the way in which, uh, you know, the, these things are territorialised and, and, and frontiers are created in many ways. But behind it all, as, as migrants who come from Greece via Egypt to Australia, um, we're also very aware of, 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 of well, uh, you know, that Athena, which is way beyond, you know, the sort of the Hellenized version. It's much more about defining Romeo Sini, which includes uh, all these other elements uh, in it. Um, and, uh, and so it's a, it's a much more inclusive idea rather than an exclusive one. Okay, thank, thank you very much. You.